Hey students, we now begin Unit 1B. Well, this will be Unit 1B.1 .1 to be specific. <clears throat> Social Psychology. Many of you may be wondering why we are starting the year with the last chapter of the textbook. Well, there are several reasons for that. The first is simply because it is one of the more interesting units we will cover, so it is a great way to start the year. Second, we will get to investigate some basic psychological principles in real-world application. Third, many social psych principles will be incorporated into later units. And fourth, because it, is a major, because it is a major component of the AP Psychology exam. Let's begin. So what is social psychology, and who in the world is that guy? As we discussed on the first day of school, psychology is the scientific study of mental processes and behavior. Keeping with that principle, social psychology is the scientific investigation of how the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of individuals are influenced by the actual, imagined, or implied presence of others. During our exploration of the field of social psychology, you will need to pay particular attention to the origins and history of social psychology, major assumptions made by individuals and groups that impact social interactions, methods of investigating psychological concepts, social psychology's contributions to society as well as the study of psychology itself, strengths and weaknesses of social psycho psychological principles. We will discuss those points in more detail throughout the unit but for now, we begin with the father of social psychology, Kurt Lewin. Who would be the first psychologist to use scientific principles to suggest that our behaviors are shaped not only by our internal disposition or personality, but also by the environment and situation in which we are in? Kurt Lewin, like many early psychologists, was a gestalt psychologist, which we will explore further in Unit 7. After being injured in World War I, fighting for the Germans, he returned to the University of Berlin to finish his dissertation. As a German Jew, Lewin immigrated to the United States when the Nazis took over Germany, and once there, he developed an interest in group dynamics, specifically leadership styles. Because of the contrasting political ideologies of the 1920s and 30s into the 50s, like laissez-faire economics, authoritarian dictatorship, to answer the question of which political system is more efficient, Lewin developed an experiment. In this experiment, Lewin organized a group of boys into three groups. Each group was tasked with building birdhouses. Two groups had a leader who was Kurt Lewin, and the third group had no adult supervision whatsoever. This was a part of each group experiencing different leadership styles. In the authoritarian group, uh, the boys were assigned specific tasks in building the birdhouse. For example, one boy would cut the wood, another would nail the pieces together, another would sand the wood, and so on and so forth. The boys were even given specific instructions on how to carry out their respective tasks. They were then heavily monitored by the authoritarian, Lewin. The boys in this group were not allowed to deviate from their assignments, and any complaints or dissension to the leader would be punished severely. In the democratic group, the boys had the opportunity to vote on who got to perform what task, and if they wanted to change tasks, they could. Using the democratic approach, the boys had more of a say in the production of their birdhouse. In the laissez-faire, or hands-off group, there was no leader, and the boys were left to figure out everything on their own, like who would be responsible for each step of the birdhouse production. So which group do you think had the most efficient leadership style? Surprise! It was the authoritarian group. The authoritarian group, or the group that was controlled by dictator, where Lewin had to, where Lewin dictated every task that the boys uh, were responsible for, and they were actually uh, much uh, more efficient, much more effective at producing birdhouses at a greater rate than any other group. However, that is only true if the leader is present and can maintain constant and, tri and strict surveillance of his workers. In the real world, it is almost impossible for one person to keep an eye on every single thing that every individual is doing. Also, and more importantly, 
The boys in the authoritarian group had no experience making decisions for themselves. Without receiving constant instruction and supervision, the boys struggled to maintain focus and production declined. So according to Lewin, which leadership style is most efficient without the presence of an all-watching and all-powerful leader? That's right. The correct answer is democracy. All right. The reason this is is because the, the boys or the individuals or experimental subjects uh, in the democratic group actually had a say in the production of their product, this, in this case being a birdhouse. Because of that, they took a vested interest um, in their design and their production quality. And so when uh, the leader stepped out, or if the leader uh, could not be present for any reason, they had no problem continuing production on their own because they had that experience with cooperative um, work and cooperative play, whereas the authoritarian group did not. So when the leader removed himself, they just collapsed. They couldn't. Uh, they needed that leader to can maintain order. And then the laissez-faire group, the hands-off group, it was just chaotic the whole time. They needed a strong leader to at least uh, tell them what to do or at least uh, show them the basics of how to build the birdhouse. Those boys did not get much <laughs> They didn't get much done. All right, well, that concludes Unit 1B.1. We have about six or seven more of these to go, so they get better. See you guys next time.